So how do we go about getting blood flow back into the head? We've had awesome conversations with people now in the POTS community, the MECFS community that understand really well how th this particular problem of being able to sustain blood flow into the brain is hugely detrimental in symptom causing. But the question that we have to start to, to compete with is like, number one, how do you get it back? We got to talk about that. But then number two is like, what is, what is going on underneath this? And we're going to start to dive into the term baroreceptor. And for some of you, that's going to feel like a little bit heavy and sciencey, but I promise we'll make it super easy. And if you understand that, it really helps understand not only like what's going on inside of you, but it, under, it helps you understand how people are using medications, why people are recommending compression and maybe what you can do about that, why people are recommending salt and whether or not that's useful for you, rather than just like onboarding this information is like, well, that's just what everybody does. Let's try to make a link where we can talk between those two subjects and say like, well, what is going on here? We get a lot of comments that talk about blood pooling, right? And the assumption is kind of, um, like we just kind of like run with the idea that the, the blood must be pooling into the legs and because it's pooling into the legs, it can't get to the heart and it can't get to the brain and then I feel bad. So all I have to do then is then figure out how to squish the blood back up and then that solves the whole problem. And in some degrees, that's kind of like the basis of, okay, well, that's, you know, when people go to the hospital and they're dehydrated and they don't have enough fluid in their body, then we see that, oh, like the, the amount of blood they have actually goes down and they don't have enough to circulate and they're more likely to faint. So in the hospital, when that happens, we load them up on saline and they feel better because we just like rehydrate them again, just like, you know, <laughs> like, like beef jerky, right? We just kind of like give them some more fluid. And then so the response to that is like, well, just maybe at home, we can mimic the saline and we can have you drink more salt. We can do oral hydration. And then that kind of makes it so that you have a little bit more blood volume for a period of time. And then maybe that helps with symptoms, right? So that's kind of the salt idea. But then we go a little bit deeper and we talk about like, maybe like the midodrine idea. And the midodrine idea is like, what we are going to do instead is say all of the blood vessels in your body, we're just going to make them super tight. And if we make them smaller, it's just like if you put your thumb over the top of a, a garden hose, it makes it so that the pressure goes up. And if the pressure just goes up everywhere, it's going to be forced into the head as well. And that's one thought as well. But as you know, anybody who's taken midodrine, sometimes it makes you feel better, sometimes it doesn't. But it also means that you don't get to control your blood pressure anymore. So you have the same pressure whether you're standing up and your heart has to push upwards or if you're laying down and your heart is just, you know, doesn't have to push against gravity. So it's almost like it gets rocket boosted into your head, which is kind of maybe not a good thing either. So what's at the core of this is a simple reflex, but it's the reflex that makes us stand out amongst anything else on the planet because we walk on two legs because we walk on two legs our heart is below our head which means that you have to have some extra sensors you have to have a little bit different computer that helps us know when our head is above our heart because we've got to kick in some different strategies we got to kick in some different reflexes that help us to push that blood up into the head and that's what we're talking about here the simple way we talk about this is we use the term a baroreceptor system. Baro means pressure. Receptor is just a type of sensor. And when I say system, it means we're talking about from the actual receptor itself all the way through the mechanism that controls blood pressure. So if you, if you think about if you drive, if you have a car, if you've been driven around, you might notice that modern cars, obviously you have to have air in your tires. But modern cars will like give you a little signal on your dashboard if the air in your tires is getting a little bit low. And what does that mean? So how does that, how do we figure that out? So some engineer figured out that if you put a little pressure sensor inside of that tire, then it can detect when the pressure is lower. And then it sends a little signal through a wire up to a little microchip computer in your car. And that microchip computer gets signaled, gets the switch flipped. And then that's going to turn on a light, ding, on your dashboard. And then that light is supposed to signal to you as the motor system, the thing that does stuff, to go and put more air into that tire. 
until that pressure sensor turns off and then the sends a signal up the wire and then it'll turn the light off and then everything is happy, right? So that's what happens with these pressure receptors throughout your body. The two biggest ones, the main ones, happen to live right here in your neck. And they're called the carotid baroreceptors, okay? And so they are kind of on the road to your head and they, every single heartbeat, like in milliseconds, are doing that reflex so that if the pressure goes up, like everybody knows, well, everybody has experienced that if you lean forward and like tie your shoes, that as you tip your head forward, now there's gonna be more blood that rushes to your head because it's below your heart. It's below gravity, right? And so how do you keep from just like blowing your head up every time you bend forward? Well, the pressure sensor detects more pressure and then your brain is able to decrease the amount of blood flow into the brain. It can restrict against that, which is super cool, right? And then like, let's say you lay down. Laying down is the opposite. Now it's super easy to pump blood into my head. So now I wanna just let it relax. My heart rate's gonna come down. My blood pressure comes down a little bit. My cerebral vessels are gonna normalize out so that we can just be nice and easy. One of the interesting things that we find is that when people do testing for things like POTS or MECFS, they measure two main features and that's gonna be your heart rate and your blood pressure. Sometimes they even forget to do blood pressure, but blood pressure. But that's also gonna be how they are gonna check for like midodrine responses, right? And they're gonna look at your blood pressure and assume that if your blood pressure is normal, then the blood flow going to your head is also normal. What we have found and other people have found as well is that just because you have a normal blood pressure in your body doesn't mean that that normal blood pressure is being transferred into your head. The reason for that is really simple. The blood pressure in your body can be dynamic and it can be absorbed by your skin, which is stretchy. So if my blood pressure goes up, I have plenty of room to expand that and to be able to circulate that blood faster, which is really, really good for replenishing muscles if I'm working really hard. So it's really useful. But your brain doesn't really have that benefit because it's locked inside of a skull. So if I push too much blood pressure in, it's just like when I bend forward, I'll feel too much pressure in my head and it can start to damage stuff. And we don't like that. This is like intracranial hypertension territory. Okay. So what our, the blood vessels in our brain do a really good job of is when we get that, that pressure receptor that says pressure is going too high, then it will restrict against that and close it down. And same thing, if the blood pressure is going too low, it'll dilate the vessels in my brain and let more blood flow come in. But that response is separate from what happens in my neck down. So there are different responses. Most of the people that we see are somehow in some way diagnosed with POTS, whether that's right or not doesn't really matter. But what that means is that their heart rate is going up and their blood pressure is relatively stable. But what we measure is that even the environment of a normal blood pressure, we will see changes in cerebral perfusion or brain blood flow where we're getting not enough brain blood flow. So then you have to ask like, how does that make sense? If the blood flow in my body is normal, why isn't that going into my brain? And that therein lies the problem. So this is where those baroreceptor systems become super, super important because if I can't detect that blood flow going into my brain well, then we become what, what is called pressure passive. And what that means is the amount of blood that goes to your brain is fully dependent on your heart and gravity. And the reflexes that would normally allow us to maintain a really stable blood pressure in our head fail. And so in those cases, these baroreceptor systems, whether they're in your neck or whether it's in your heart, or whether they're the ones in your brain become very, very important for being able to figure out how you unwind this particular problem. So in a quote from Johns Hopkins published on hopkinsmedicine.org, it says, in people with POTS for unclear reasons that may differ from person to person, the blood vessels don't respond efficiently to the signal to tighten. As a result, the longer you're upright, the more blood pools in the lower half of your body. This is the general structure that people operate on when we think about POTS. And it kind of makes sense if you don't think about it real hard because it was saying, okay, like I stand up, 
the blood's just going to like not do as well coming up to my brain. And it's going to pool in my legs. But one of the things that we then have to kind of run into is then how do you deal with the fact that in a POTS diagnosis, we also have normal blood pressure. So if someone has normal blood pressure, but all of the volume of blood has dissipated down into their splanchnic arteries and into their legs, why is it that they can still get it into their arms? And this becomes a really core question to understanding how we have to separate and think about blood flow to the head and blood flow through the body being two separate mechanisms that interact beautifully. So if you feel like this is kind of the state you're in or a problem that you're trying to solve, we can give you a couple places to maybe start to think about it. Number one would be to check your own blood pressure or look at the testing that you've done and see, is my blood pressure actually kind of normal, but I'm still having symptoms of hypoperfusion. I'm still operating like I'm not getting blood flow to my brain, right? So that's, that's a really good starting place. And then from there, then you go like, but then how do I fix it? And that part is a little more nuanced. It's a little harder to DIY, but the way you can think about it is if we go back to that example about the air pressure in our tires, if we're finding that that tire keeps going low, but you're not getting the signal, right? So you get out of the car and you're like, man, why is this tire always flat? Something's wrong in the system. You'd have to go and start with like, this what the mechanic would do. They would start with and say, is the sensor inside of that wheel, is it rusted, right? Is it not working? It's not getting the sensation, right? That would be like the actual barrel receptors themselves or the arteries themselves not being able to detect the change. Then you could say like, oh man, that, that sensor looks beautiful. Then you'd say, okay, well, is there something going on with the wire that's going into the computer? Great, these are nerves, right? So is there a problem with the nerves that are being transmitted like the glossopharyngeal nerve that's coming from the baroreceptor to the brain, right? So we check the nerves, what's going on there. And then we'd look at how they function, how they correlate with other functions as well. Then you could look at it and say, well, if the nerve's fine, maybe in the brain it's not being processed well. And this is super common with people that have had um, viruses or concussions or anything that has affected the function of their brain where we might have little pockets where it just doesn't work as well. It's not able to generate as much output and therefore it can't detect that change. So the signal comes from the sensor, travels up through the wire, but the computer's kind of corrupting the signal a little bit. Or we could say that the computer system's working great, but the light in the dashboard is out, right? So everything works, but the light in the dashboard is out that doesn't give you the signal to get out and go put some air in the tire. Or, the whole thing could work really great and you are just lazy and you don't get out and put air in the tire. And that would be a problem with the motor output. We're not generating enough signal. So I realize those things are all a little bit abstract, but those are the things that someone that's trained will look at to be able to determine where in that system it's not working and then develop an action plan to figure out how do you start to solve for those things. So at home, best place to start is like, what does my blood pressure look like relative to my symptoms in my brain, especially when I'm standing up. And then how do I start working backwards to understand that? Probably getting someone on your team that understands that nuance is gonna be really useful because you're gonna shortcut through a lot of trial and error and um, being able to actually understand what problem you're trying to solve. So I hope that helps and talk to you soon.